in the heart of America, nestled within the hills of West Virginia, an astonishing discovery was made that challenged conventional historical narratives. This is the story of an ancient bell embedded in a lump of coal that has intrigued and fascinated both believers and skeptics alike. It all began in 1944 in a quiet town of Buchanan, West Virginia, where a 10-year-old boy, Newton Richard Anderson, would stumble upon something that would spark a decade-long mystery. Newton was an ordinary boy with the everyday responsibility of keeping the coal furnace in his family's home well stocked. In those days, coal was a vital source of warmth during the cold West Virginia winters, and young Newton was tasked with the important job of ensuring the fire never went out. One evening, as he descended into his dimly lit basement, he scooped up a particular large lump of coal onto his shovel. But as he carried the load, the weight shifted and the coal tumbled to the floor, shattering into two pieces. As the coal broke apart, Newton noticed something unusual. There, protruding from one of the broken halves, was a slender metallic object. Newton carefully set aside the coal with the mysterious object and continued to feed the furnace with the remaining pieces. Over the next few days, the boy couldn't stop thinking about the object he had found. Determined to uncover its secrets, he retrieved the lump of coal and, with a corded mallet in hand, began to carefully extract the object. After some effort, a small bell emerged from the coal. Eager to see it in all its glory, Newton cleaned the bell with a scrub brush, unintentionally scrubbing away all the traces of the coal that had encased it for who knows how long. Word of the discovery quickly spread, and the bell became an object of conversation among neighbors and friends. But the story of the bell found in coal didn't end there. As the time passed, the bell began to gain notoriety beyond the small town of Buchanan. It caught the attention of creationists and those fascinated by the possibility of ancient antediluvian artifacts. In 1997, the bell was featured in creationist and apologetics book. And soon after it, it was used in evangelistic tract that presented it as an indisputable proof of a worldwide deluge, a relic from the time before the Great Flood described in the Bible. The legend of the bell continued to grow. Intrigued by the story, they sent a representative to investigate. Newton Anderson, now much older, was interviewed and the bell was prominently featured in the 1992 CBS docudrama production called Ancient Secrets of the Bible. The story of the bell became a staple in creationist literature with articles and books continuing to describe it as a genuine antediluvian artifact. Even the San Diego Museum of Natural History took notice. For a couple of years, the bell was displayed in the museum, drawing the attention of visitors and sparking debate about its origin. The museum was so impressed by the artifact that they made an offer to purchase it. But Newton decided to hold on to the bell. But it was just Newton's word against the world. Was there any truth to it? In the early 1960s, a man named Boris Belas took the bell to a geological department at the University of Delaware in Wellington. The experts there examined the bell and confirmed that it was handmade. Later, when Newton Anderson moved to Florida and became a chemistry teacher, he bought the bell to Dr. John Morris of the Institute of Creation Research in 1973. Dr. Morris conducted further analysis on the bell at the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Morris's analysis used a method called nuclear activation analysis, which found that the bell was primarily made of bronze with an unusual mix of zinc and arsenic. A detailed microprobe analysis revealed no remaining traces of coal on the bell. The bell's unusual metallurgical composition is intriguing, especially if it is indeed from before the flood as described in Bible. The materials and methods used to make the bell might not match those from post-flood times. The bell's clapper made of iron still produces a clear beautiful sound. 
the bell's composition and the craftsmanship suggest it could indeed be a relic from a long time before the recorded history, adding to its mystery and significance. Not just that, even a polygraphy test was conducted to find out if Anderson was lying. In 2007, Stan Fulmer, a highly regarded polygraph expert who had experienced with death row cases, conducted a lie detector test on Anderson. The results confirm that Anderson was telling the truth and his account of the discovery was found to be credible. The detailed polygraph examination report is available online for those interested in reviewing it by the name Fulmer 2007. The most intriguing and interesting part of the bell was top of the bell. Newton spent a lot of time researching it, reaching out to multiple universities to help identify the demon-like figure. The figure bore a striking resemblance to Pazuzu, the Babylonian demon of the southwest wind, and the Hindu deity Garuda. Both the Babylonian demon and the figurine on the bell had a horn on their head, though the one on the bell was particularly broken. Their narrow faces were early similar, but Garuda, a beaked flying god, is still depicted on top of most of the bells in India. The wings and kneeling posture of the figure on the bell were typically of Garuda. Anderson began to wonder if the figure could represent a spirit being that was worshipped by a pre-flood civilization. Perhaps after the flood, when the Earth's population began to grow again, this same spirit inspired similar religious people in different parts of the world, including the Orient. Critiques, however, were quick to point out the similarities to the Garuda bell found in modern times, suggesting the Anderson bell might not be as ancient as claimed. One such critique, Hudson, argued that the bell was likely a Garuda bell made of brass, possibly crafted by an artisan in India or elsewhere in Asia. He speculated that the bell could have carried over from Far East to the mountains of West Virginia, where it was accidentally dropped onto an exposed coal sea. Hudson proposed the coal dust, particles and water, a byproduct of coal mining known as coal slurry, quickly could have gathered around the bell, eventually hardening into a solid lump of coal that made it appear as though the bell had been inside the coal for a long time. Anderson, however, disagreed with this theory. He pointed out that the bell was found in a block of hard black coal, not lignite, which is a softer brown coal. To give you context, the coal that Holyman delivered to Anderson's, which comes from West Virginia's Upshur County. This type of coal dates back to Carboferious period, specifically the Pennsylvanian epoch, which lasted for about 323 to 298 million years ago. This means the coal formed long before dinosaurs ever roamed the earth. West Virginia coal can be categorized into different types based on its quality and appearance. At the southern end of the state, where the coal is near Kentucky and Pennsylvania border, you find anthrite coal. Anthrite coal is a high quality, hard and shiny black. In contrast, about 90% of the coal in West Virginia is bituminous coal, which is softer and has a flat back color. There's also lignite, which is an even softer and browner coal with less carbon content. When Newton Anderson found the bell, it was in a lump of a coal that was probably bituminous, given that it was black and not brown. Anderson noted, if the lump had been made of a softer light brown coal, it would have been discarded rather than used in the furnace. Additionally, Anderson noticed that there was no one in the community who was a Hindu or of Indian descent or who traveled to the Far East and returned with such an artifact. But after considerable research, the man who delivered the coal to Anderson's house, his abandoned mine was found. They even found the remnants of his decaying coal wagon, evidence of a long time past. This mine had taped into a red stone coal seam, a rich source of bituminous coal, which is typically found deep underground, around 100 feet below the surface. This information casts serious doubt on Hudson's theory. Hudson had suggested the bell could have fallen into an exposed coal seam, only to be later encased in coal slurry that hardened 
into a solid block of coal. But given the mine was far underground, this scenario could be highly improbable. How could a small artifact like a bell have ended up in a deep underground coal seam, becoming a part of solid block of black coal? On the other hand, bronze artifacts can easily survive for thousands and millions of years. It's possible that when Great Flood ended civilization, one of the bells made before the flood was buried along with the mass of floating vegetables. Over time, this mass could have transformed into coal, which was eventually mined in West Virginia, only to reappear in Newton Anderson's coal bin thousands of years later. The mystery of how the bell ended up in the coal remains unsolved. But the deep underground location of the mine, Mark's Hudson scenario, seems far-fetched at best.